All right, the next speaker is Dr. Larry Mayer. He's the director of the School of Marine Science and Ocean Engineering and the Center of, uh, I'm sorry, Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. And he's also a commissioner of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. He's going to talk on the status of the extended continental shelf activities in the Arctic. Thank you, Pablo. And uh, I guess several, several of the speakers yesterday and uh, even this morning mentioned the extended, con the extended continental shelf. And what I'm going to try to do is to uh, very, very briefly uh, summarize or update you on the status of the U.S. activities in terms of extended continental shelf mapping, but also try to touch upon the activities of the other coastal states. And it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, that uh, I present my comments in a personal capacity, and I don't at all represent the, the United States government. When we talk about um, the extended continental shelf, we're really uh, talking about a part of the Convention of the Law of the Sea. This is a remarkable constitution for the oceans. And in particular, we're talking about one little article of it, Article 76, just 617 words that have this remarkable power of uh, changing the definition of the continental shelf. Geologists know what a continental shelf is, but the lawyers have stepped in here and define now a juridical or legal continental shelf. And that juridical or legal continental self, uh, shelf offers the coastal state the opportunity to extend its sovereign rights over resources of the uh, seabed and uh, subsoil um, to, to ranges much, much further than the geologic continental shelf. They provide a very kind of complicated formula to do that, a set of formula to do that. Basically, if we look at what the continental shelf, shelf looks like, if a coastal state has a continental shelf, a geologic continental shelf that extends beyond 200 nautical miles, Article 76 provides these mechanisms that then let you find what they call the foot of the continental slope, move outward from there 60 nautical miles, or, and it's an and or, determine the thickness of sediment on the continental margin and find the foot of the continental slope and find the point where the thickness of sediment is 1% of the distance back to the foot of the slope. Very, very complicated. You can mix and match these to whichever is to your advantage and then apply some constraints or what they call limit lines where you basically look at either the 2,500 meter depth contour plus 100 nautical miles or, and it's an and or again, 350 nautical miles from the baselines so basically the shoreline, and again, the article provides a complicated way to put all this together, and at the end of the day, you come up with the limits of your extended continental shelf. It's very complicated. You don't have to worry about it. What you have to remember, though, is that in order to do this, we have to map the seafloor. We have to determine the foot of, where the foot of the slope is. We have to determine where the sediment th what the sediment thickness is, where the 2,500-meter contour is, and where 350 nautical miles from the baseline is. Um, as we've all know and have heard many times, the U.S. has not acceded to the Law of the Sea Convention yet. But many years ago, 2002, 2003, Congress came to our lab and asked us to start the process because we have always hoped that we would accede to the treaty and so start the process of collecting the data needed to establish the limits of the continental shelf we also in the U.S. recognize the Law of the Sea Treaty as uh, international customary law, and in that context, too, we're establishing what those limits are under international customary law. And so since 2003, our lab has been mapping all around the world where the U.S. has a potential for an extended continental shelf, but what you can see is that by far most activity has taken place in the Arctic, where we've had at least eight cruises doing this mapping since 2003. Um, globally, we've mapped more than 2.6 million square kilometers, collecting new high-resolution, what we call multi-beam sonar data, very high-resolution data, and I'm very proud to say those data are made available publicly uh, as soon as we uh, finish collecting them. We have concentrated so much on the Arctic because the Arctic is a very special case in terms of an ocean basin. 52% of that basin is geologic continental shelf, and I think the next highest number is something like the Atlantic with only 17%. Um, geologic continental shelf. And if we start off with 52% of the basin is geologic continental shelf, much, much more of that is going to be extended continental shelf. 
belonging to somebody in the region. So it's an area where most of the basin will be uh, extended continental shelf. As we know and have heard, it's an area that is uh, resource rich and also, of course, an area with a very, very fragile environmental conditions and the <laughs> law of the sea treaty allows you to extend your protection of that environment um, through the extended continental shelf too. It's very interesting in as much as there are five Arctic coastal states that have a potential extended continental shelf and they're all opposing, they face each other, so inevitably there's going to be tremendous potential overlap in where their extended continental shelves will be. It also, of course, presents a tremendous logistical challenge. How do we map in the ice? Because even though we've seen, and as I'll mention in a minute, it's been tremendously to our advantage in terms of mapping, the only thing that it's probably good for the, the degradation of the sea ice, um, particularly in, in the summer, um, we, most of the areas we map still are ice covered and we have to figure out how to do that. We've heard also about the, the very small number, one and a half, two and a half maybe icebreakers that we have. We're fortunate that our Arctic icebreaker, the Healy though, is equipped with a very sophisticated mapping system, one of these multi-beam mapping systems, and so we've been able to learn how to b break ice and map at the same time, and we've done this over the years. We're not the only ones who've done this. Uh, there are now probably about five other um, relatively large icebreakers equipped with multi-beam sonars. Most of those uh, equipped because of uh, the desire of a coastal state to uh, collect data in support of uh, law of the sea issues, and some of them, like the German, uh, the German Polar Stern and the Odin, have been used by other nations, by some of the coastal states, to help their um, ECS mapping efforts. Interesting, and to put it in the context of this meeting of diminishing ice, none of that mapping would have been as easy to do as it has been, and it has been that easy, but it would have been much, much difficult 15 or 25 years ago, and that's because of these curves we've seen of the diminishing uh, ice extent, um, minimum ice extent um, in typically September, the, a, a decline of about 13 percent per decade, and I saw that Walt actually showed that picture to where we are. This is as of two days ago. We're on track for the record minimum of 2012 right now. Using the Healy, we've mapped about 442,000 square kilometers in the Arctic. You can see most of that mapping is done with individual lines because we're breaking ice. We can't do the kind of normal mowing the lawn we do uh, in open water. But in 2012, we were able to get complete coverage in this area because, believe it or not, despite the fact that almost every year we run into the ice margin at 75, 76 degrees north, in 2012, the ice margin was well above 80 north. And so it was really quite remarkable. And we can't go into an unexplored ocean like this and start mapping like this without making a number of new discoveries on our very first cruise, and you could barely see, this is what the existing map looked like. We ran over a, an 11,000 foot high seamount, now called Healy Seamount. We've mapped many more undiscovered seamounts since then. Uh, we found fields of pockmarks on Chukchi Cap, indicating um, gas effusion, probably, and also uh, home to interesting habitats. We saw what we call megascale glacial lineations. These are not just iceberg scours. These represent the presence of an ice sheet way high up on Chukchi Cap that has totally rechanged our understanding of uh, the presence of ice in the Arctic in past ice, ice ages. And as Senator Murkowski mentioned, we have done some dredging in terms of trying to understand the geologic continuity of the features we see there. And these dredge results have really changed our understanding of the geologic evolution of the Arctic. And we'll be seeing a series of papers coming out about that very, very soon. So to look at the, a summary of the US activities over the last few years, we have the EEZ, the US EEC, um, marked off here. From our desktop study way back in 2002, with the, the little we knew about the, the morphology, the shape of the, the Arctic basin at the time, we assumed we would find the foot of the slope, which is that point we measure everything from at a, at a, at a spot like here, and then just with a simple uh, exercise from that, um, assume that we would have an extended continental shelf, which looks something like this. Not insignificant, something like twice the size of the state of California um, in terms of area. What we've learned since then, though, is that the foot of the slope actually continues way up here. 
and this has changed our view of uh, where the extended continental shelf um, is. This is something that's being worked on right now by what's called an ECS uh, task force, um, and we will have indeed an extended continental shelf at least as large as this and maybe larger, but it will inevitably overlap with Canada, whose extended continental shelf comes out this way. So we will clearly have some negotiation with Canada to do. This is an area where we still have a dispute over a boundary in the EEZ, let alone the extended continental shelf. The one place we also have a tremendous overlap with is with Russia, but in this case, we already have a negotiated maritime boundary, and the Russians have respected that boundary in their submissions, and we respect it. And so there is no issue in terms of overlap with Russia. That's a negotiated boundary that exists already. And let's look at what the other nations have been doing. Russia was actually the first nation to make a submission to what's called the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, a commission that adjudicates the submission and sees whether it's in line with the, with the treaty. Uh, they made a submission back in 2001, and that submission was turned back to the Russians. Not, it was not accepted by the commission, um, saying that they just didn't provide enough of the, of the underlying data. And so since that time, the Russians have been remarkably active, mapping all over the Arctic. They've acquired a multi-beam system on the uh, academic Fedorov. Um, they've been working with uh, both uh, nuclear icebreakers uh, leading the multi-beam ship. They've been using s research submarines. They've been using drilling platforms, a tremendous effort they've made, and they have put in a new submission now supported by a lot of data that, again, covers a very, very large part of the Arctic, but, of course, respects that negotiated maritime boundary with the U.S. So this is the state of the Russian submission right now. Uh, it's being adjudicated by the commission and should hear back maybe within a year or two on that. Norway has had a small area where it has a potential extended continental shelf. They worked very hard and very early. They made their submission uh, in December of 2006. They've received what we call positive recommendations, meaning that the commission agreed that their limits were in accordance with the treaty, and so that's been all established. But one of the very neat things and one of the real advantages of the the treaty in general is that the commission is not allowed to look at a submission if there is a disagreement over a maritime boundary. The commission has no jurisdiction over maritime boundaries. So if one country says we have a dispute over maritime boundary, it stops the process. And so what has happened is as countries make submissions, they work very hard to negotiate any kind of maritime boundary dispute. And so this little area in Norway led to the resolution of a 40-year unresolved maritime boundary between Russia and Norway, which was resolved on uh, June 8, 2011, in the Barents Sea. And so this is, we see this all over the world between nations that have, have unresolved boundaries. They're trying to resolve them uh, so that their submissions will be looked at. Uh, Canada has two areas in the uh, Eastern Arctic and the Western Arctic. In the Eastern Arctic, which is in the Lincoln Sea, this is one of the ice-thick areas. Even in all the diminishing ice, there's still tremendously thick ice. The last bits of the multi-year ice still sit in the Lincoln Sea. And so they've been working uh, with, with, with uh, Denmark, who share, again, a boundary through Greenland, um, on looking at the Lomonosov Ridge. They've been doing this mostly from ice camps, from helicopter-deployed single sounding measurements, some of the most amazing measurements in the world, $17,000 for a single depth measurement, but that's the value to the nation uh, as they send helicopters out to make a measurement and been trying to put together a picture there. In the Western Arctic, Canada has been working um, in close conjunction with the U.S. We've had, despite our overlaps, we've had four wonderfully collaborative cruises. You've seen this picture yesterday from uh, Admiral Zunkoff. Um, what he didn't show you is this picture, and I, maybe he hasn't seen this picture. Uh, this is the, uh, the Healy freeing up the Louis Saint Laurent uh, in thick ice, and at this point, the Healy is backing down. That's, and you can tell, uh, you probably can't see it here, but you can tell the, uh, this is a Canadian uh, ship here because they're wearing their uniform with shorts uh, <laughs> in, in the Arctic. Canada, Canada had collected what they thought was all the data they needed for their submission because there had been a decision um, to, to uh, establish limits that did not include the North Pole. The night before the data was sent to uh, the commission at the UN on uh, December uh, 2013, uh, the press released this picture of what were indeed uh, an accurate representation of what the Canadian uh, submission would look like. And the then Prime Minister Harper uh, 
said, no, the North Pole is part of Canada. He withdrew the Canadian submission and has since, uh, since that time, Canada has spent about $60 million buying multi-beam systems, equip equipping them, having uh, three, two icebreaker cruises over the last three years to try to collect data in that region to demonstrate that the North Pole is indeed uh, part of a Canadian submission. And we'll see Canada will be making their submission, that revised submission in 2018. Denmark, working uh, through its um, Greenland territory, has again been working very hard in this area. They have been the ones uh, leasing Russian icebreakers, lease, leasing Swedish icebreakers, German icebreakers, working collaboratively to try to collect data in this area. In their initial documents, and all the initial indications were that their submission would be in this region here, just going up to the North Pole. But when the Canadians withdrew their submission and said, no, they would be making a submission that included the North Pole, um, the Danish, when they made their submission, turns, it turned in a very, very aggressive um, submission, and this has now been turned in uh, December uh, 2014, that included not just the North Pole, but extended all the way to the Russian boundary up to Lomonosov Ridge. And so this has led to a very, very interesting situation of tremendous overlap. The red is the Russian limits of their submission. The gold is the Danish limits. And we have yet to see the Canadian limits, which will inevitably come in here too. So we're leading to a very, very interesting situation. And so to try to just wrap this up and looking what the situation is right now, a very complicated picture, but let me just try to make that a little clearer. We have, in terms of a U.S.-Russian overlap, there will definitely be overlap, but we have a negotiated boundary, so there just is no issue between the U.S. and Russia in terms of the limits of the continental shelf. There is a tremendous issue, and, and it's wonderful that scientifically we've worked together for so many years, uh, and now we leave the trouble to the diplomats and the lawyers, as the Canada and the U.S. will have to work out how their overlapping submissions are going to be divided. We have each written letter saying to, that we allow the Commission to look at anything, um, but we will resolve bilaterally those, those boundaries. There's a small issue. Iceland has uh, protested uh, Norwegian uh, and Danish uh, region here, and that will get re resolved in the next few years. But the big issue, of course, will be the Danish, Russian, and Canadian overlap. And uh, that will be uh, lots of work for maritime lawyers and diplomats. And first, we have to see what the commission says. And, and, and as, as this is, a, again, a very personal statement, as I see it, I think most of their submissions will be upheld by the Commission, so they are entitled to those areas. It's a question of how they're going to divide it. And so let me end there. I promised Pablo I wouldn't go over time. Did I go over time? No. No. By, so by one minute. By one minute. Well, five. you know, that's okay. a, and, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.